Anyway, welcome to a little talk all about the search for El Dorado um, featuring Sir Walter Raleigh and um, uh, um, who I've been fascinated by ever since I suppose uh, I was living in Venezuela um, and heard of his trip to what he called Guyana um, and it is next to a modern day Guyana for sure. Um, and um, someone, I think maybe I found in a bookshop, I found um, this little reprint book um, called The Discovery of Guyana by Sir Walter Raleigh, uh, on which um, uh, all this story is based really. Um, and um, Raleigh was uh, born around 1554 in Devon, it came from a Devon family, probably uh, relatively well off. We don't know much about his early life, but he did really well. He was successful. He was popular at court, as I'm sure you all know. Um, he um, was uh, a main instigator behind the Virginia colonies, and I think that's what he's known for today. Um, even though he himself never went there, he sent two um, boatloads of colonists to what is now Virginia, and he gave it its name after the Queen, um, one in 1585 and one in 1587. The first colony um, disappeared. Um, no one really knows what happened to them. It's known as the Lost Colony. Uh, the second colony um, were more successful, but still failed and, and had to be rescued, uh, amongst others, by Sir Francis Drake. So actually, his Virginia colonies weren't particularly uh, successful. Um, but he still had that relationship with, with the Americas, with, with, with America. Um, anyway, Raleigh made the mistake um, uh, in um, 1591 of uh, secretly, well, not a mistake, he married uh, one of the Queen's uh, ladies-in-waiting called Elizabeth Throckmorton. And uh, the mistake he made was to keep it quiet from the Queen. And when she found out some years later, she was furious with him because he was a particular pet of hers and put him in the Tower of London. Um, and not for particularly long, I think for six months or so, and um, she went with him. The Tower of London, I don't suppose has changed much since then, the buildings around it will, will have a lot. Um, um, they, they were in the Tower, uh, this little, um, picture that I found of Raleigh with his other, the other uh, activity for which he's well known, which is tobacco. Um, lovely little engraving, isn't it, of someone coming to throw water over him. Uh, I don't know if he's in the tower then. Um, but the main, I think, the main significance of his time in the tower, apart from feeling a bit down about life generally, was that he had time to think and dream. Now, with his Devon and seafaring connections, he'd chatted to ship's captains and heard rumors uh, of uh, the El Dorado legend. Um, there was a particular French captain in Falmouth who, who, who told him all about it. He also studied, studied what they called then uh, rutters. Uh, I guess the closest equivalent today would be routier. Um, they were sort of guiding documents, a, a descriptive map, uh, and heard of the Spanish um, attempts to discover this uh, so-called golden city of Manoa. Um, Raleigh's first son was born in the tower, though he died young, and his second, Walter, or Watt as he was called, was also born there. Um, and um, so Raleigh was thinking about this. Uh, the Armada, the Spanish Armada, slightly distracted him, um, but he was always dreaming about making, finding out more about this, um, this fable, this El Dorado that the Spanish were looking for. And you might wonder why I put a picture of uh, Bogota in Colombia uh, next. And it was really just to to illustrate uh, where another important um, origin of the legend might have come from. The Spanish, of course, were already extracting vast quantities of gold, plundered gold almost entirely from
from Latin America through their capital in Lima. And um, there was a, 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 an expedition that a chap called Aguirre did, made um, down uh, across, he started in Lima, went across the Andes, went down to the Amazon. Um, it, his expedition, uh, they started off with 250 <clears throat> people. And uh, by the end of the whole trip, after mutiny and mayhem, uh, 150 of those had been either murdered or marooned um, by Aguirre and his henchmen. Um, but um, up in near Bogota, near today's Bogota, uh, and Colombia is a lovely little country that's the headwaters of the Orinoco in many ways, or, or many of, of its tributaries. Colombia, wonderful country for colors, for fruits, for anything like that, for festivals with jeeps and then anything like that. But there's this lake called Lake Guatavita, which I'm guessing is some sort of volcanic crater. And legend had it that the local Indian people who were called the Muisca, uh, coated their king, chief, in gold dust. And then he went on a raft across the lake and washed it off. And actually that lake has been being searched for a long time. I think there was a documentary on the television I saw not long ago. Uh, it's very deep, I don't think they found much yet. But if you go into the gold museum in Bogota, um, which is an incredible place, um, they've got this beautiful little golden raft model. It's, it's tiny, it's about three inches long. Um, it was only discovered in uh, the 60s, I think. Um, but it is meant to depict the Muiscan king uh, going out on his raft to be ceremonially uh, cleaned or coated with gold dust. And what I'm sure was, was uh, word of this uh, ceremony would have got back to Spain, to England, and, um, and Rally and uh, 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 would have been very excited about it. Now, um, Rally also knew of Antonio de Berrio, who was a Spanish captain, um, who was absolutely convinced that El Dorado uh, existed and that he knew where it was. He made several what they called entradas or entrances into the South American mainland. Um, his first in 1583, he got very close to this tabletop mountain, which is called Cerro Altana, and is near um, today's uh, Puerto Ayacucho on the border between Venezuela and Colombia. Uh, absolutely amazing mountain. Um, and so he went up the Orinoco way further than Raleigh did in the end, and um, into the Meta River, whose headwaters are in uh, just outside Bogota. And um, he wrote to the, to the Spanish king and said he, he knew where El Dorado was. And I just thought I'd quickly show you uh, a more modern map so you know what we're talking about here. Um, the Orinoco, I'm not sure if you can see when I move my mouse, but I'll try just in case. The Orinoco Delta is marked on that map, sort of in the middle. Um, and that's where the Orinoco comes out, obviously. Um, the the um, Orinoco itself continues to the west and then turns to the south. Um, and Raleigh made it about as far as uh, where it says Puerto Ordaz on that map. So it looks like not very far, but there's a strong current and they were only rowing. So uh, it was a considerable achievement. Um, and also note while we're there, Ciudad Bolivar, um, a little bit further upstream because uh, we'll come back to that. Anyway, Raleigh was terribly enthusiastic by now about claiming a bit of Guyana or Guyana for uh, England. And the Queen gave him a patent um, permission in 1594 and he raised money, um, 60,000 pounds in those days, which uh, doing a bit of research, I think is about at least 20 million pounds today, um, which you would have needed to get together four ships, uh, provision them. Uh, he, sold, he sailed with a uh, hundred Englishmen uh, and nothing left to lose, as he put it. I think he always thought uh, he was about to descend into poverty, so was, was on the lookout. And um, 
Raleigh sailed uh, from Plymouth in 1595. Um, they, um, he was 43, by the way, and it was the first time uh, in his life that he'd actually been to America, uh, despite all his involvement with um, the Virginia colonies. Um, the, um, in Trinidad, uh, which they, uh, sorry, the route was Plymouth, Lisbon, Canaries, and that's pretty much what you did because of the winds then. From the Canaries, it was three weeks to Trinidad. They made that crossing. He misses all that out of this book, um, uh, probably because he wasn't really meant to be attacking Spanish ships, which is exactly what he did for a bit more plunder on his way. Um, and um, anyway, he, they got to Trinidad, uh, they lost a few of his ships, but they caught up with him, um, and he landed uh, at uh, near San Jose, which was then the capital of, of Trinidad, newly built by the Spanish. Um, Raleigh immediately um, sacked it, uh, uh, burnt, burnt it down, uh, killed most of the Spanish he found, and um, probably to the delight of the local Indians, who he was quite good at setting up against the Spanish, um, and um, for, 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 to his good luck, he managed to capture Anthony Burial um, and um, wind and dined him, I think, and got a ransom out of him um, and um, got more instructions as to maybe what, 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 he, what he should do. And ironically, they weren't very far from a place called Makuro uh, in today's Venezuela where Christopher Columbus uh, first put the first European foot on South America in 1498, so uh, just under 100 years earlier. Anyway, um, Raleigh set off uh, across the, the, the relatively short distance of the Paria, uh, Gulf of Paria into the Orinoco Delta. Um, the, 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 they only rode because they knew that uh, the prevailing wind, winds come down the river, there was no point in sailing. So they knew they were gonna to have to row and he had five boats. He had uh, four that took 10 men each and one larger one, I guess with him, uh, which had 60 rowers on it. Um, and it was nearly all the people he brought out from England, uh, plus uh, a local escaped slave at least, um, who I'll tell you a little bit, bit more about later. Um, so they were about a hundred strong, um, brigands and scientists, as they might have been referred to. They took a native pilot that they'd found in Trinidad, who said he knew the way. And um, after uh, five days, they captured another Warao Indian and used him as a pilot for the rest of it. And this uh, scene here was a picture I took some years ago in the um, Orinoco Delta. And I honestly think it won't have changed. That would have been pretty much as Raleigh saw it, apart from the plastic buckets, um, the Moriche palm tree behind the um, hut um, is an incredible um, tree. And the local people use it for at least seven purposes. Uh, they use it for roof, for rope, um, for a hammock, the fibers, uh, Moriche palm uh, makes the best hammocks. Um, for a boat, if you, if you float it, for food in two ways, one for the heart of the palm and one uh, particularly appealing white grub that lives in the uh, palm tree that um, uh, you, you chew up and swallow, it doesn't look very appealing. And finally, the, the palm wine that of course is essential to, uh, to life in miles from anywhere. Um, and they went through the delta, which is an, as I say, an enormous area. It took, them, it took them 15 days just to get to the main uh, river. Um, and I've actually um, got no photos that I could dig out of the Orinoco here, but it's a really wide river. The, the picture at the bottom there is actually one of the tributaries of the Orinoco. It's the Kaura River, just to give you an idea of the scale. Uh, with a considerable, considerable current rowing upstream, you would have had to hug the banks because the current in the middle would have been um, too strong, it would have just swept you down. Um, poling or rowing, they, they decided to row 
uh, actually the native people would all have polled. Uh, they wouldn't have, have grown at all. Um, and to the south of the Orinoco, um, the problem that Raleigh came up against was that none of the rivers were navigable. This is a typical waterfall. This is the beautiful uh, Para Falls at the end of the Cowra River. And so you navigate, you navigate, and you come to something like that. And obviously, um, with a boat, unless you carry it, um, that, 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 that stops you. you there's, no, there's no going on from that. Um, anyway, Raleigh went up the river. He loved the sight of the first mountains he saw. He, he said he was in a sort of Arcadia. And some years after his trip, this rather marvelous engraving uh, was produced. Um, showing Raleigh and his, his uh, crew beautifully turned out, showing this idyllic view of life in, Ven in, in what he was calling Guyana, today's Venezuela, uh, a few little mountains in the background, some birds tweeting, and these rather forbidding uh, uh, large lizards or snakes, um, because the poor old escaped slave on day 12 went for a swim and got eaten by one. And I don't know if that um, illustration is, is telling that story, but uh, he was one of the early casualties. Now that could have been a caiman, uh, the Orinoco crocodile uh, would have been very numerous on the Orinoco and they're, they're certainly big, they go up to about five meters. Um, or it could have been one of these, um, the anaconda. Um, which again is perfectly capable of swallowing a human, though I'm not sure it would do it as swiftly as that, um, as that illustration showed. Uh, this actually is taken on the plains of Venezuela. Some plants sent me that picture uh, some years ago now, but uh, it's a great one. Um, anyway, you want to be careful with them. Um, anyway, Raleigh uh, uh, finally. Um, on day 23 of his journey, arrived at uh, what is now Puerto Ordaz. And he was lucky enough to meet an Indian chieftain called Topiawari, and um, who was the most uh, senior Indian chief in the area. Um, the, there were hundreds of different tribes, but he, he had a certain seniority. He was certainly old. Raleigh, I think, estimated him to be, you know, 70 or 80 years old. Uh, which for an Indian chief in those days, I'm sure was considerable. Um, and I suspect the chief saw Raleigh coming too and told him all sorts of wonderful stories that uh, got his enthusiasm going. Raleigh was asking where the Indians got their gold plates from and Topiawari told him uh, you know, just pan it out of the rivers and you, know, you find these big nuggets and uh, so that's easy. And then Raleigh asked him all about Manoa and the, the mystical city and where it was. And Topiawari told him that, uh, well, sadly, some years before, a fierce tribe had come and expelled all the old tribes out of the area to the south of where they were. So not only was it inaccessible, but there was this, there was this fierce tribe um, uh, in charge of it. And that they'd come down the river uh, and they wore um, red hats, um, which is interesting because um, the Spanish had just expelled the Inca from much of Peru, and they were known for wearing red hats, uh, but I don't think um, they were ever anywhere near here. So I think it was just a useful uh, 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 fact that made Raleigh believe Topiawari even more. Um, and the other uh, memorable event that happened to Raleigh here was that he ate an armadillo for the first time. Anyway, Raleigh was convinced by this pretty much that he knew enough to go back to England and tell everyone where the lost city was and the kingdom of El Dorado. Um, and he went just three or four days further up, upstream uh, as far as um, the mouth of a river called the Cowra, uh, the one I showed you earlier. Sorry, not, not, no, it wasn't the Cowra. It was um, uh, the Karani River, where, which comes from a place called Kanaima, which we'll see later. Um, and that was the furthest point they reached, um, which he reckoned was 400 miles. 
upstream. I'm sure it felt like that. In fact, as the crow flies, it was about 250, uh, but still a considerable achievement. And in the, where the River Karani comes into the Orinoco are another set of beautiful waterfalls, but quite impassable. So Raleigh just sent three parties into the surrounding countryside, looking around, trying to find, uh, you know, uh, ore, um, of, of any sort of mineral, anything useful. And they did come back with some ore. This rather pretty shot uh, just shows uh, the tannin in the water there, um, because the Guyana Shield, which these rivers come off, uh, is one of the most sort of leached and ancient rock formations in the world. Um, and it's a beautiful area, and I just thought I'd show you a couple of pictures of if he had been able to get up that river, what he would have seen, which I'm sure would have made him even more poetic when he wrote his book. Um, that is the Aoyan Tapui, the Tapui Mountain, the largest in terms of uh, surface area, uh, tabletop mountain in Venezuela. Um, and it is in fact the one that the Angel Falls come off. Um, and um, that is uh, a little village called Kavak at the far side of the um, Ayantapui mountain. You can see the scale of the thing. It is just majestic. You could see that hidden kingdoms could be, could be tucked away here. Um, this is Kanaima. So sad that, that we can't, uh, uh, Last Frontier started doing just Venezuela. It's always such a regret that the state it's in, we can't, we can't go there because that was one of the highlights of any, of any trip to, to Venezuela. There's a beautiful Canaima Lagoon. Um, and heading a little bit further south, um, the people, this is a remote people. It's absolutely believable that there could still have been hidden kingdoms there. Um, this is way south of Canaima on a trip I made, gosh, about 20 years ago now. Um, to see this Indian tribe um, who have had almost no contact with, with modern man. Thank goodness for them. Um, the, uh, the thin guy there uh, with, is, is wielding a blowpipe and showing us um, how it works. Uh, and the chap sort of leaning over him and sighting down, down, down it is Sandy Gould. I don't know if any of you remember him, the newsreader. A uh, lovely guy um, who I went on that trip with. So that's uh, that is totally unchanged since the day that Raleigh couldn't quite get that. Now, um, Raleigh set off down the Orinoco, having taken, I can't remember, 25 days or something to get up. It took him five days to get down. And if you read his book, um, he starts to be a little bit creative in his writing. Um, he talks about this tall mountain uh, with a waterfall coming off it in a very poetic um, manner. And I think he's just bigging up the whole Guyana thing um, for his audience. Um, um, the, that is a photograph of the Angel Falls in the Mist, but of course it's, it's probably a thousand miles away from where, um, from where Raleigh was going down the river. Um, it is a beautiful, beautiful sight, 3,000 feet from uh, top to bottom and the tallest in the world. Uh, I know there are a few people from Guyana on this call, so I'm still gonna stick by my guns. It's the tallest waterfall in the world. <laughs> they have another one to rival. Uh, also very beautiful. Um, anyway, Raleigh got back to Trinidad, um, went to Margarita, uh, which is the island just to the west of Trinidad. Um, because he was Raleigh, he thought, well, let's see what plunder I can get now. So he tried to sack uh, the city of Cumaná. Um, um, and uh, he failed disastrously. He lost 48 men. And probably more seriously, he lost the ransom that he'd been paid for uh, handing Berger back. So it was disastrous. Um, and uh, who knows, he might have lost a few sort of samples and things like that. He certainly arrived back in England with some samples of ore and things, but really very little to say uh, for himself, apart from his imagination and memories. So he returned, uh, eventually, he, he went via Cuba and returned to Plymouth 
in September 1595, so at the end of the year. Um, and uh, Raleigh, I think he was in a bit of a low at this point. He was in the doldrums. He felt himself relatively poor again, um, but he was never one to be uh, locked down for long. Um, he heard reports that the Spanish had found a portrait of a giant made of gold, and I think his enthusiasm returned. And apart from publishing the book, he produced this chart, um, which some call the creature in the map. And I've, I've put it upside down as well as the right way up, because Raleigh's chart has north and south with south at the top. Uh, but I think if you look at the bottom right one, you can recognize, start to recognize where you are with the delta across the right, the Caribbean coast along the top, um, the two squiggly rivers, the, the, the northern one being the uh, Orinoco and the southern one actually being the Amazon, and then this wonderful lake, the Lake of Parima, whatever it was called, uh, with, on, on whose shores was Manoa, the city, the city of gold. And um, so Raleigh published, published his book. And um, over the next couple of years, he um, sent a couple of other expeditions to explore the area. Uh, history doesn't really relate whether they found anything useful, what they found. He wasn't with them. Um, of course, this is a Dutch map that was produced probably 30 years after this had all happened, beautifully illustrated. You can even see the headless men whose faces are on their shoulders that Raleigh men, uh, mentions that he's heard rumours of in his book. Uh, you can also see the Amazonians, um, which were, was another, uh, people were convinced about these Amazonian Indians at that time. Um, and um, all was going okay for Raleigh. He, he, he'd done up his country house, Sherburn Castle in Dorset, uh, which you can go and visit today. Um, but then, in 1603, um, Elizabeth died. And that was not great for Raleigh, as I'm sure most of you know, um, because um, I, I don't know whether they were looking for a scapegoat, but James, who succeeded, immediately um, arrested Raleigh on possibly, probably trumped up charges um, about a plot um, and gave him a death sentence. Um, now, it was commuted, which is why one thinks that maybe James knew it was a bit trumped up, but despite all that, Raleigh spent 13 years in the Tower of London um, from 1603 onwards, um, and uh, his wife, Elizabeth, Lady Raleigh, um, was there with him. Um, and he offered to go back to Guyana. This was his big effort to escape. He um, he wanted to go back to Guyana. He wanted to give uh, England uh, a, 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 a prize. Uh, no one let him go until eventually, in 1616, James granted him uh, uh, permission to go to Guyana on two conditions. Firstly, um, that he didn't uh, attack the Spanish because we just, uh, some years earlier, had declared a, a, a truce, a peace with the Spanish. And secondly, he had to return with gold. Now, that leads us on really to the tragic ending of this story. Um, Raleigh sailed uh, in 1617. He took his son with him. He sailed with 20 ships, uh, full of optimism. Um, he got as far as Trinidad again, uh, where he stayed and he sent a, 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 an expedition up the Orinoco again on the same route uh, this time with his son Watt, uh, under a captain called Keynes. Uh, and no one really knows exactly what happened, uh, but at some point um, the uh, contingent uh, attacked the Spanish um, at um, Santa Tomé, which is uh, today's Ciudad Bolivar. Um, and in that battle, Raleigh's son, who was 23, was killed. So. Keynes returned straight away to Trinidad, uh, told Raleigh what had happened, uh, and was so ashamed of the whole thing that Keynes himself then killed himself. So it was a completely disastrous uh, uh, expedition, Raleigh's second visit to Guyana. 
they had no gold. He, he came back to England um, and um, was beheaded in 1618. Again, possibly slightly trumped up uh, because the Spanish were calling for his head. Um, but can you blame them? He'd attacked them one time too many, I guess. And his wife was distraught. And uh, uh, there is were a rumor that she kept his head in a red velvet bag until her death in 1647. And that was pretty much, um, that's my story. I'm sure, sorry, it hasn't got a, a more cheerful ending, but it is a fascinating and uh, area and part of, of Latin America and still is. And I just thought I'd show you a couple of pictures um, from today's Guyana. This is a map that was produced in 1681. So nearly a hundred years later. And it still shows Lake Parime on the map, even though we now know today, uh, thanks to Google Earth, that uh, no such thing exists. But interestingly enough, uh, the name of the lake is also referred to as Rupununi. And of course, the Rupununi savannas of Guyana are um, uh, very much visited. I'll show you a photo in the next slide. Um, the other interesting follow up is that in 1857, there was a gold strike in El Callao, which is a scruffy town in Venezuela. I guess it was just a dot on the map then. Um, it was a very rich gold strike. And for a while, Venezuela was the largest producer of gold in the world, uh, 15 tons per year, only overtaken when um, the Southern Africa uh, operation came online. So you could say there had been an El Dorado there all along. Jimmy Angel, I'm not going to tell you the whole story of Jimmy Angel because that would be another whole talk. Um, Jimmy Angel was a, was a US pilot and he was uh, bumped into a gold prospector in Panama uh, in 1935 who told him to come and fly him down to this area, the Grand Savannah of Venezuela, where he knew there was gold to be panned. And Jimmy Angel says they landed by this river, on this little savanna, uh, panned 40 pounds of gold and flew out. And Jimmy Angel spent the rest of his life trying to find that spot again and never managed it. Um, though he did, of course, find something else. He found uh, the waterfall that bears his name. And this is the Guyana. Uh, savannah, as I mentioned, that um, again, I, I think, apart from the old fence post, probably made of palm trees, will have changed very little uh, since Rally was there. Certainly, the wildlife, the giant river rot you see there, the manatee at the top, uh, <laughs> the Land Rover maybe, um, the um, Victoria Amazonica lilies, the, the local people. Uh, absolutely unchanged. And um, that is the other angle that you can get to uh, the area of the Table Mountains today, um, Venezuela and, and Guyana. Um, so um, that, that is the end of my little story, I think. I think that's my last slide. Oh no, yes, yes, one more. Um, but that is the end of Raleigh's story. Um, and you might have noticed I've been spelling Raleigh without an I in it. That's just because that's how he spelt it. But um, uh, today he is, he is mainly spelt with the I. I just thought there were three other lost cities that I could come up with in Latin America. I'm not going to talk you through them today, but Machu Picchu, of course, was in effect a lost city, only discovered in 1911. Um, Vilcabamba, where the Inca were, were driven by the Spanish when they fled Peru, was only discovered uh, more recently than, than Machu Picchu in the mid uh, 19s. Um, and one that's never been found is uh, the one that Colonel Fawcett was looking for. Um, and I don't know if any of you have read his book. It's, it's a good read. Um, uh, uh, he disappeared though uh, in 1925 in the Mato Grosso, Brazil, uh, looking for another fabled lost city. Um, his son wrote a really good book about it. So um, yeah, that was that was that. And thank you very much.